Okay, so welcome everybody. This is Debbie Hockman um, from the David Posnack JCC. We are extremely happy to welcome you um, with our partnership with the Friends of the Sterling Road Library to uh, the book discussion with Linda Levin. Today's book discussion is going to be The Tattooist of Auschwitz. We are asking you all to turn off your video because we are going to be showing a video in the beginning. And when we show the video in the beginning, it'll play a lot easier for everybody if we don't have the, um, in basically the intrusion of all the, you know, those little pixels through the air that are trying to work all at the same time. So we're asking for your cooperation to turn off your video and your microphone. After um, we play this video, we will be, um, ask you then to turn on your camera and you will be able to see what's going on. As well, um, we are absolutely thrilled that we have doubled in size since our last book review last month. And what we're gonna tell you is that we're gonna ask for your patience because as you know, if you've ever attended a Linda Levin book discussion, Linda likes to be interactive and have everybody be part of the discussion. But in doing that with so many people on the line, um, we're going to ask you to use your raise hand um, function, which is in the reactions on your Zoom screen, or we're gonna ask you to put your responses into the chat room and we're gonna manage it that way. So we're gonna basically stay muted until we call on you um, during the discussion period. But at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Linda and Linda's gonna go ahead and get us started uh, with a welcome and we will get this video started for her. Linda, it's on. Hi everybody, hi everybody. I'm so glad to welcome all of you. And I have to say I'm overwhelmed with our, uh, with our turnout. And let's see, I'm trying, I just lost my gallery view here. Okay, oh, I guess, okay. All right, so um, I really, I'm sorry not to see all of your faces on, our, on my gallery screen. I'm, I'm so glad to welcome everybody from the Sterling Road Library Book Club, the JCC Book Club, and of course, so many of you that are new and I can't wait to see your faces. What is always frustrating with the, with the Zoom is that we love being spontaneous with questions and comments and conversation and discussion you know, when we're talking about books we've read. So of course today we know that our conversation is not gonna be as spontaneous with technology, but we're really gonna give it a shot. So we really hope you'll try to participate. Um, we're just, the reason we've got the videos off right now is I wanted, there's just a very short video of Lali Sokolov. And he of course is the subject of the book that we've just read. And it's a short video that will give you a visual. And if you blink, you're gonna miss it. So it's only one minute. And I want to introduce you now to the man who was once the tattooist of Auschwitz, Lali Sokolov. Okay. Interview with Lee Sokolov, 29 February 2004. My name is Lee Sokolov. Is that the name you call me? No, I was born Ludwig Eisenberg. What name are you known as? As a Lely, they call me Lely. Are you married? Lally? I was married. Listen to me for a while. Gita, Gita Sokolov. Where did you meet him? I met in Auschwitz-Birkenau. How did you meet I was Auschwitz-Birkenau tattooist, a tattooer, and I tattooed her number of her left arm, and she tattooed her number in my heart. Thank you, Debbie. Good, good. I hope everybody got to got to see that. Can everybody now, uh, Debbie? What do we do now? Everybody turns on there. Everybody, you can turn on your cameras, and then yeah, Linda will be able to see you. Love to see your faces. Great. Hi guys. Hi everybody. Slowly but surely, we're getting everybody on here. Great. 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 So you want us to unmute or mute? 
Stay on mute. Please yeah. stay muted. Okay. So you got to see Lolly, and if you would, you couldn't really understand what he was telling you is he was born uh, with the last name of Eisenberg. Lolly is, of course, a, a nickname for Ludwig. And um, he's telling us that he met Gita at Auschwitz. And I love that line where he says he tattooed her on her left arm and she left her number on his heart. And you'll see that, that that's, that's so. So now that you've met Lolly, let me introduce you to the author who tells his story. Now, what we know about Heather Morris is that she's a native of New Zealand and she's now a resident of Australia. And she describes that for several years she was working in a hospital, but she was studying how to write screenplays. And she actually wrote a couple, uh, several that were somewhat successful. But then in 2003, she said she had coffee with a friend who knew she was interested in writing screenplays. And this friend told her that someone she knew had just lost her mother and she suggested that Heather should perhaps we meet with the friend's father because he's an elderly gentleman who just might have a story that's worth telling. So Heather says that the uh, the day that she met that she met Lolly Sokolov was a day that changed both of their lives. She says when she went to meet him that first time, his grief was palpable. He showed her Gita's picture and he kept saying, wasn't she beautiful? Just wasn't she beautiful? He had just lost the woman that he had loved for over 60 years and now he was anxious to tell their story. But it's interesting that before he told the story to her, he wanted to confirm a few things. And one was that she was not Jewish and she is not. And he was pleased she had very little knowledge about the camps and even less did she have contact with anyone who was really Jewish. So. She, she says to him, why, why does that matter to you? And he said, he explained it very simply. He wanted the story that she wrote to be his story and his alone. He didn't want anyone else's personal baggage, anyone else's family history to enter his story. He wanted a clean slate. And that's what she offered him. Secondly, he said, so tell me, how fast can you write? And she said, well, what, are you in a hurry? And he said, yep. He admitted he was in a hurry. He wanted to see it published, but he was most anxious to be once again with Gita. And so it is that Lolly begins to tell his story. And he, this is a friendship between the author and Lolly that grew over a period of three years. Lolly embarks on this journey of self-scrutiny and he shares with her innermost details of his experiences in the Holocaust. And she says that he told the story in a piecemeal fashion, not necessarily any events that were linked together, Sometimes he told memories in a very clinical, factual fashion, but other times he showed more emotion. His language was straightforward. She says she tried to write the story very much in the style in which he spoke it. She originally wrote this as a screenplay before she reshaped it into this, her debut novel. And of course, as a novel, what we know is that the book has found tremendous success. Heather Morris has recently published her second novel. You might have even read it already. It's called Silka's Journey. Uh, the character of Silka is one that she introduces us to in our current book, In the Tattooist of Auschwitz. We'll talk a little bit more about Silka in a bit. So now you understand how the story came to be. And I want to give you a brief summary of the book. And if you read it a while ago, perhaps this will refresh your memory. If you haven't read it yet, maybe you'll be enticed to do so. So here's how Lolly begins the story. It's April 1942. He is 25 years old. He's a Slovakian Jew, and he is forcibly transported to the concentration camps at Auschwitz-Birkenau. Upon arriving, he sees dogs and rifles, and he sees men shot in front of him just because they didn't move fast enough to get into their designate, designated lines. And he says to himself at that point, I will live to leave this place. I've got to walk out of here, a free man. At first, he's engaged in hard labor. They send him over to build the barracks in what will become Auschwitz II, Birkenau. But when his captors find out that he can speak several languages, they give him another job. He becomes the tatovier the German word for tattooist. He's now tasked with the job of permanently marking his fellow prisoners. And with this new role, he's now given his tools in a tattoo bag. And that bag comes to serve as his shield. And it indicates his new status. It's very improved status. He's now a prisoner under the command of a political wing. And he's given his own room. He's given extra rations. And most importantly, He's given more freedom to move around. Lolly, 
is in prison for over two and a half years in Auschwitz. He's got a guard who stands guard over him day and night. His name is Baretsky, Stefan Baretsky. And he watches as Lali numbers the thousands of prisoners who are transported to camp. Day by day, Lali sits at his table and he describes to us how he imprints thousands of numbers into skin. And at the same time, he bears witness to all of the atrocities and the barbarism around him. At the same time, he does see small acts of kindness and some acts of compassion, and he describes that as well. Risking his own life, Lali uses his privileged position to make secret deals. He engages in the black market. He gets together with local Polish contractors who work nine to five, and he, he arranges with girls who work in a building known as the Canada. It was the nickname there. And those girls had the job of sifting through all of the belongings, all of the clothing left behind by the prisoners who were, who was, most of them went to the crematorium. And that clothing they went through and they sifted through it and their job was to find jewels and hidden money for the Germans. But Lolly is able to work out an agreement with the girls. He's able to exchange some of the smuggled gems that the girls have provided. And he exchanges those gems for food, which he then divides up and distributes to help keep some of his fellow prisoners alive. It's one day now in July, the year is 1942, and all of a sudden Lolly sees a young woman trembling in his line, and she's waiting for a tattoo to be placed on her arm, and immediately he's drawn to her. To use his own words, he takes a look at her, and somehow he says he knows he will never love another, and only later does he even learn her name. Her name was Gita, but he tells the author that in that very first encounter with her, he vowed that whatever it took, he was gonna to manage to survive the camp and marry her. His story depicts the horror of the Holocaust, man's inhumanity to man, but there is also hope and resilience. And as Lolly tells the story to the author, we see that it is a love story. It is a testament to the endurance of love and humanity under the darkest possible conditions. So it sounds like a beautiful story, right? Readers all agree. It is a heart-wrenching, moving love story. It was number one on the New York Times bestseller list for a very long time, and then it stayed on that list for over 51 weeks. It's been translated into 47 languages. It sold more than 3 million copies worldwide. As the author herself says, who doesn't love a love story? But you should know there's also criticism in terms of style. The author uses an abundance of cliches and dialogue, and sometimes, to me, the book sometimes read as if it was a screenplay, which, of course, was the format in which it was originally written. But the main controversy is over the fact that the story claims to be based on a true story. It's marketed that way, that it was a true story. Yet, according to one New York Times article, the question is which parts of the story are actually true. Now, it's strange, according to Lali's son, that the spelling of Lali's name as well as Gita's tattoo number are both incorrect. According to the way in which the numerical system would have worked, Gita's tattoo number would have been lower at the time she arrived to Auschwitz in April of 1942. Another noted inaccuracy is that it would have been impossible for Lali to have secured penicillin for Gita when she suffered from typhus because of course penicillin wasn't even readily available at that time. So some of the errors do seem small, but it's interesting to note that the Auschwitz-Birkenau Memorial and Museum have taken issue with a range of the storylines and have claimed there are numerous historical details of the camp that are wrong. One example would be there is no factual basis that the women ever collected gunpowder in their fingernails for the explosion in the crematorium. It's one of the events that she describes in the book. Another reviewer from the New York Times asks an important question. He says, is there a greater imperative for novels about an event as catastrophic as the Holocaust to get basic facts right? The problem is, he points out, if there is some fictionalizing of events, it could undermine the credibility of that which is historically correct. In other words, when the theme is the Holocaust, does too much fictionalizing take away from the actual truth? It seems that the storyline that seemed to disturb the Auschwitz Memorial the most was the depiction of Silke Klein. Now, if you remember from the book, 
She is Gita's good friend. She's very beautiful. She's 16 years old, and she has been taken as a sex slave by the Commandant Schwarzuber. According to the memorial, such a long running relationship between a prisoner and the Commandant would have absolutely been, to use their words, non-existent because of the severe punishment facing the Commandant if it was discovered. Incidentally, Silke Klein's stepson is said to be suing the author for her portrayal of his, sec of his mother as a sex slave, not only in this book, but also in the sequel, her newest book, Silka's Journey. On the other hand, having told you all that, we know this is a novel, so we have to expect there's going to be a certain amount of creative license. The publisher themselves has said that this is an unusual hybrid. It's a hybrid of memoir and historical fiction. The author responds by telling us in her notes that she wanted to present not a lesson in history, of which there are many, but a unique lesson in humanity. She tells us she has written a story of the Holocaust, not the story of the Holocaust. She leaves the academic history to others. But one thing is clear, it's compelling, it's an uplifting story, and it certainly has struck a chord with so many readers, and it does give us a lot to think about and a lot to talk about. So, what do we know about Lolly? He's a very well-developed character. He's probably the best developed character in the book. And of course it is his story, so therefore we're not surprised by that. So I want you to picture Lolly. You just saw him as an older man, okay? But we find out when he was 25 and he's, he's in the cattle car, we find out that he had once had a reputation as a ladies' man. He loved to look at beautiful women. He loved to flirt. He was a real romantic but he always had dreams of meeting just that right woman for himself, that, that right woman. And of course he does in Auschwitz. His mother was a great influence on him. His mother had, had taught him how to treat women. And of course that advice later came in very handy in Auschwitz. We know that Lali always saw himself, himself as a Slovak. Being a Jew was incidental. He was not religious at all. And we see that later in the camp when he observes others praying, but he himself, has no interest in participating. We know he is close to his family because when he learns that every Jewish family has to send one family member to a labor camp to work, one of the German work camps, he volunteers hoping it will save the rest of his family. And of course, little does he know that his volunteering doesn't help anyone in his family. So try to picture him now as a 25 year old he is dressed beautifully. He's in a pressed suit. He's wearing a crisp white shirt. He's wearing a tie. He's immaculate because he always believed you had to really dress well, look your best. And then he's shoved into a cattle car, crammed full with other men. Destination and future unknown. And when the train finally stops after days of traveling, he is there. He is at Auschwitz. Now, it's your turn. I've gone ahead and set the stage for you. So my first question I wanna throw out is this. Those of you that can remember the book, and I hope it's a lot of you, think back. What were some of the attributes that Lolly possessed that you think enabled him to survive his experience in Auschwitz? What do you think? Think of some of those scenes. Feel free to use the chat. I feel like I'm doing a, um, you know, like a fundraiser or something. Feel free to use the, the chat button or, uh, you know, raise your hand. Okay, I see a hand that's up. Anybody? Yeah. Do you know how to use the electronic one? Well, no. Lolly had a new many languages and that served to help him. Pardon? He knew many languages. Absolutely, and right away that separated him from the other prisoners and gave him this very unique experience. Anything else you can think of? I tried to do the chat. I was gonna say the same thing, that he was smarter than the chat. I don't know if you can hear me. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Can you hear a, a, a squeaking noise? Can you hear me? I was um, trying to send something in a chat. Oh, okay. How, how do you send it? I think you might have just now. Did you? Right, but go ahead and speak. 
I, I just was saying the same thing, that he was smarter than his captors. Oh, yes. Well, we see that that's definitely true with his guard, Stefan Beretsky, who is just a cold-blooded killer, but he does stand guard over him. Although what I want to tell you is that one of the things that I noticed about Lolly is that he's got a lot of charm and he understands human nature. Charm, first of all, he's able to win over Gita. He knows how to develop relationships with the other prisoners, with the contractors, with his guard, mind you. And in one scene, we see the guard. <laughs> We see him when he actually goes ahead and just shoots some prisoners who are resting at the side of the road. Not provoked, only because he feels like it, he shoots them. So we see that it's amazing that he's able, Lolly is able to figure out how to manage this guy. Oh, Linda just went mute. Uh, Linda, you went mute. Okay, okay, well now I'm unmuted. Is everybody else muted? I think you hear me, Renee. Okay. So here's the thing, Linda, yeah. Linda, one thing, just so we can, once again, we have a lot of people online. So to handle this, what we're doing is we're asking you to either to use the raise hand um, option, which is found in your reactions at the bottom, or to put it on chat, which is means basically you're doing a text into the chat room. Both of these are at the okay. bottom. But right now, Linda, we have, I have a couple of comments in the chat room. So let me just read those to you. And then maybe we could call on the people from that have their hands raised right now. But um, you had basically uh, comments about with Lolly that uh, Brenda Frank said he was smarter than his captors. P. Silberberg said he was clever and observant and could communicate with different languages. Debbie Cole wrote, he showed tremendous resolve and determination. Diane Berman wrote, it seems, oh, no, I got you there. <laughs> Hold on one second. Uh, Robin wrote, he was an operator. I did not necessarily think of him, much of him, except that he was a survivor. Um, Stephanie Swerdlow said he had the ability to think on his feet. Eileen Miller said he was very resourceful and clever. Uh, Dora mentioned he was good at relationships and have people listen to him and do things he wanted. And Sherry said, uh, Lolly was very observant of his surroundings and knew how to play the game. Right. Let me just, let me address some of those. I think those are great. Just, that's I I just, Linda, before you do that, can we also just have, because the people have been waiting with their hands up, do we want oh. to do all of that and then you can address them all at sure, once? Sure. Go ahead. Okay. So Marlene Mazur has her hand up. So we can unmute Marlene Mazur. And Marlene, if you want to go ahead and ask your yeah. question. I found my question. Oh, I, I thought I was commenting before that he was charming. Yeah, yeah, Com comment. Yeah. He, had, he was charming. He had, he had a lot of moxie and charisma and really knew how to um, work in every situation that he was put into. Absolutely, absolutely. And we're going to talk a little bit more specific about how you're right, how he, how he really does all of those different things. Terry, um, maybe your, your hand goes up. You can unmute. Terry, you can unmute. You have to unmute yourself. Unmute. Okay. 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 Can you hear me? Uh -huh. Oh. You have two, it sounds like you have two devices possibly on. I do. You need to hang one of them up. Not that one. <laughs> we can't hear you. All right. So it's interesting trying to get this technology working. Yeah. Well, we'll go on. Let's go on to Pamela Diaz. Okay. That's me. Okay. Hi. Hi, I'm trying to, I'm having problems with this. I've never done this before. You're doing great. Go ahead and say your comment. I, we can hear you. I just, I just want to say, I haven't read the book yet, but from what I hear about the man, he was a well-dressed man. He was. He was well-dressed. And, and you know what? He, it was a way of thinking. He really, he was able to think in a certain way, to always present himself in the most positive way. Yeah. 
I want to go ahead and address some of the descriptions that you guys gave because they were really so so much in, in my same thinking. First of all, we talked about the fact that he was charming. He knew how to manage even the guard and he was able to win people over. He was a realist. Um, when he was even still on the cattle train, I, I, I thought this was interesting, in the cattle car, um, the men are all trying to escape and what they're doing is they're throwing themselves against the slats of the cattle car and all of a sudden he says to the men hey don't waste your energy if these walls could be breached don't you think a cow would have done it he's a realist but he's also an optimist he sees that men are dying in the cattle cattle car he sees the men that are dying as soon as he lands in auschwitz and some people say you know those were the lucky ones but not him he never said that because he always thought to himself no matter what his life was too good to end at that point in that place and he was going to do his best to survive. I want to address somebody who said that he was a good observer, and that's so true. You know, right as soon as he gets off of the train, he takes a look around and he notices something. He's observant. And he says about himself that he's always almost as hungry for information as food. And he immediately takes note of all the people around him, and he sees the capos. Now, he doesn't know right or wrong, morality, anything like that. He thinks to himself, you know what? That looks like an easier job. It might be one that I want to figure out how to get. We know that he's an entrepreneurial, right? He does his black market thing, and he realizes that food is currency. But the other point I wanted to bring out is that he was an amazing risk taker. Did you all notice that? Amazing risk taker. Everything he did, whether it was the black market, whether it was sneaking around with Gita, taking her behind buildings, trying to avoid the searchlights, what risks he took. But the greatest risk to me was that he actually changed tattoos. He did this on in numerous uh, occasions. And there is one specifically where there was a young man, if you remember this from the book, there was a young man who was destined to be hung in the morning. And his friends bring the young man into his barracks, into, into where Lolly was. And they say, what can you do? Can you help him? He takes the, the young man's numbers and he changes them into a snake. And then he goes to the administration building and using charm, he ends up getting somebody to put the young man's name on a transport list. Has no idea where the boy will be taken, but he knows one thing, it's going to be better than being hung in the morning. So the story is that he did save some lives by doing exactly that. We know another thing, and that is that he was very lucky. He was lucky. He's the first one to, to admit that he was very lucky. He was lucky, first of all, to become the tattooist, but he was always very kind. And this is the interesting thing. He was not only kind, he was not only lucky, but he was kind. And I often think about this thing. He was lucky to experience the idea of what goes around, comes around, you know, that whole idea of karma. Because there were acts of kindness that ended up saving his life. Do any of you remember what I'm talking about? That there were things that he did, kindnesses that he extended, that actually ended up coming back to him and saving his life. Any thoughts on that? Debbie, you're muted. Go ahead and put that into the chat room or raise your hand and we'll be able to see you. Okay. They're coming in already from Robin. He was kind to Beretsky. And uh, one- okay. um, That's right, Beretsky didn't kill him and he kept threatening, the guard kept threatening, but he didn't do it, right? Uh, Somebody with the last name Hoffman is actually raising her hand in the screen. Okay. So yes, you can go ahead. All right. The the American, the big guy, uh, who he helped yeah. with uh, the soccer game and everything. And then when he was being beaten, that guy kind of threw his punches a bit. That's right. All of a sudden, this big guy, a huge giant of a man, shows up and he ends up coming in the line to get his tattoo. And he says to Lolly, you know, he's been days on the train and he is starving. And Lolly takes one look at him and realizes with his size, he needs some food. And he goes ahead and he sneaks the guy some food. He's got, remember, Lolly's got extra rations, right? He's got the black market food. He's also got extra food that he gets. He gives Jacob food. And Jacob never forgets that kindness. And you're right. When all of a sudden, at the later in the book, all of a sudden his his black market gig is found out when they find you know the SS find his some jewels underneath his mattress. Um, Linda, sudden, also, 
Sherry wrote that, does it include helping the gypsies? Oh, yes, for sure. And we're going to talk a lot about that as well, because that was a very unique relationship. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. But the point I just want to make about Jacob is Jacob, in the end, goes ahead and says to him when he's supposed to beat him to death, Jacob goes ahead and says, I'm going to make this look a lot worse than it's going to be. And not only does he beat him, but then he actually tries to take care of him. So actually, that kindness come, came back full circle for him. And speaking of that issue, who else saved his life during that time? Do you remember what happened? So now Jacob sort of saves him from the beating death. But now what happens to him? Who ends up saving him and sending him back to the tattooist in his position? You remember that? It goes in the chat. It's in the chat. Somebody wrote Silka. Yes. yes. Right. So Silka, remember Silka? Silka is sleeping with the commandant and she convinces the commandant. She begs him. Would he assist? Would he intercede on Lolly's behalf? And he does. And ultimately, not only is Lolly saved, but he's returned to his position as the tattooist. Exactly. By the way, one other time that he is saved is, if you remember, this young man that he meets on the in the cattle car is this young man, Aaron. And Aaron is having a very tough time in the cattle car. And, um, he's, and, and Lolly is reassuring him. He says, listen, you're doing this. You're saving your family. You know, it's, he's reassuring him. Everything is going to be okay. It's going to work out. We're going to do what we're told. You'll be okay. Of course, in the end, it is Aaron who actually gets to repay that kindness because when Lolly gets sick with typhus, if you recall, it's Aaron who pulls him, literally pulls him off the death cart and convinces the men in the barracks to help nurse this guy back to health. And Lolly is, Lolly is saved. It's interesting, Aaron teaches them the whole concept of to save one person is to save the world. He teaches that to the people in his barracks, you know, and they save him. They choose Lolly to be the one. So he's very lucky about that that kindness came back. Of course, later, Lolly finds out that, sadly, that whole kindness cost Aaron his life because the SS were so angry that he had pulled Lolly off the death cart that they took Aaron. Linda, um, Linda's iPad, I'm not sure who Linda's iPad is, but she had been raising her hand about wanting to talk about the um, kindness. So Linda, if you want to unmute yourself. Well, I was going to tell you about the thing that you just finished telling us about now. So, <laughs> so okay. you did it better than I would have anyway. I, I beat you to the punch. Okay. I want to talk now for a minute. I want to say, I want to talk about how did he feel about his job as a tattooist, right? How does he feel about what he's doing? He's got all these privileges. He's got extra rations. He's got, he's, what, how does he feel about that? Any thoughts? He's, he's one, it's wonderful that he's got his own room. Of course, he's worried about that also. Stephanie Swordlow has her hand raised. She has to have felt a little guilty. I think, some of, I think some of it is also that he's, this was very sort of fatalistic, if that's what, that somebody had to do it. Somebody has to do that job. And he, he's going to do it. And, he's, and he did it in a way that somehow was respectful of the people that he was doing and not just not just being a torturer. That's right. Um, but somehow that justified it. Right. So following up on that, it's so interesting because the tattooist who he replaced, because that tattooist was taken away, the tattooist says to him, listen, no matter what you do here, you are a Nazi puppet. Whether you are working for me as a tattooist, whether you're working for a capo, whether you're building barracks, whatever you do, you are still doing their dirty work. But nonetheless, he does feel, as Stephanie points out, he feels that tremendous guilt. In fact, at one point he says to Gita, I have been given the choice of participating in the destruction of our people. And I have chosen to do so in order to survive. I can only hope I am not one day judged as a perpetrator or a collaborator. You know, I think, one of the things that makes this story, Lolly's story, so different from many of the books that we've read about survivors and ri books written by survivors is that it's from a perspective of a very privileged prisoner. It's a totally different perspective. He had the ability to move about. He, he was able to visit with Gita 
pretty much whenever he wanted. He would bribe the capo in the women's barracks. He would give her chocolates and he would be allowed in the women's barracks and, and he would be able to take her out. He, he had so much privacy with her. He was able to become intimate with her, right? He had his own bed. He had his own room. He ate better. These, his rations were great. And he had power with his tattoo bag. But most importantly to me, what that gave him was the ability not only for him to survive, but he was able to have Gita survive. He used his connections, right? Do you remember that? He was able to get her a job in the administration building where she, you know, where all of a sudden it's heated. He's able to see to it that she has a large warm coat and he's able to fill the large pockets that she has with food. So it's a very different experience than we're used to hearing about. He admits himself, by the way, he admits, quote, he realizes he is removed from the plight of the thousands of starving men who fight, work, live, and die together. Now, somebody brought up about his relationship with the Romani, and I wanna talk about that because that was a very meaningful part for him, for Lali, of his experience at Auschwitz. Now, if you recall, he was staying by himself, right? In, in his, it, he was, the barracks were new. He had his own room, empty bunks behind him. All of a sudden, that camp is now filled, and it is filled with a new transport of Romani. We know them better, perhaps, as gypsies, which I guess is a derogatory uh, word, but the Romani families were not separated by age and gender. The Romani families got to stay together as families. And so all of a sudden, Lali has all these children around him, all these grandparents, all these mothers, all these fathers. Why was this so meaningful to him? Why, why did this make such an impact? Any thoughts? Well, picture he meets a woman by the name of Nadia, one of the older women, and, and she relates to him and he relates to her and they can barely speak. He's, he's speaking the little Hungarian that he knows, but the reality is she reminds him of his mother. And all of a sudden with these people around him and all these children, and he's able to bring them extra food and he's able to, to play with them. It's sort of a taste of normalcy. They become a second family to him. Linda, um, Stephanie Swordlow, Robin, Diane Berman, um, and I'm going to say this wrong, but Muzzamel, that's how it's on here, they all just said the same thing. Family, oh. there was all family. So I just wanted Great. to tell you, you have lots okay, of people good. saying the same Great. thing. Good, good. Okay. In person, you guys would have been able to just sort of shout that out, right? Okay. You know, one of the interesting thing, by the way, about, about this is that Lolly makes the point, and, and he shares this with the author, and it is something to think about. Had they not all been victims together, they would never have had anything to do with each other. In fact, one of them says, you know what, if I saw you coming down the street, I would have crossed to the other side. I think it was the Romani who said that. And of course, then the Lolly says, yeah, well, you know what, I would have crossed first. You know, so they both realize if they hadn't been in the same the same space, they, they would not have had anything to do with each other. So um, there is one night, of course, there's a lot of commotion and all of a sudden he goes outside and he, to his horror, he sees that the Romani are all rounded up. And the next morning he's still hopeful, hopeful, hopeful that maybe they were just transported to another camp. But of course, we know that's not what happened to them. They were, in fact, exterminated. And the next morning, he finds out that the crematory, he realizes that it's spewing all kinds of ash and it's falling all over the camp. Lolly tells the author that that loss of the Romani was perhaps the most terrible loss that he experienced in Auschwitz. So... We've talked a lot about Lali. I want to talk about Gita. She wasn't quite as well developed a character. I don't know if you all agree with me about that, but what do we know of her? What do we know of Gita? She's sort of a typical teenage girl. She remembers she is 17, almost 18 years old when she comes. He falls in love with her at first sight. He loves her beautiful eyes. And we see her the way the author is portraying her as, as a girl, as a teenager. In fact, she's walking with her friends. She's got her arms linked in theirs and they're holding hands at times. And when they see Lolly, they're giggling because he knows he's interested, 
you know, they know that he's interested in, in Gita. And uh, when, he, when, he's, when they're together and, and he's there, he'll, the girls will push her forward. So it's a lot like the way we would expect teenage girls to be acting. In typical teenage fashion, when he manages to get letters to her, when, when Beretsky brings letters to her, she reads them over and over in the barracks and she reads them aloud to her friends. What we see is that for Gita, it is Lali, the thought of him, that he's even getting her through this whole experience. It's interesting that in one of their face-to-face -face conversations, it's actually their first one, Lali is struggling with what to say to her. So he's really just, just first time talking to her and he doesn't know what to say. In fact, it's funny because he comes up with the dumbest thing he says to her and he realizes how dumb it is. He says to her, so how has your day been? And she looks at him and she says, oh, it, you know, it was, I got up this morning, I had a great breakfast, I kissed mama and papa goodbye, I went down the bus to work, and he realizes what a dumb question that was. But it's a very telling exchange that happens because he finally says, okay, okay, you're right. Just tell me something about yourself. And she says, well, there's nothing to tell. And he says, well, of course there is. He says, listen, I'll start. I'll tell you, I'm Lolly. I have a mother, I have a father, I have a, a brother, I have a sister, I come from Krampaki. And now it's your turn. Tell me something. And she says, I will. I am prisoner 34902. I live in Birkenau, Poland. He says, no, no, no. I mean, outside of this. I mean, outside, just she will only repeat her prisoner number. She will not even give him his last name. You remember that? Until she's ready to leave. What becomes obvious is that he, Lolly, is still able to see himself as a whole person the way he was before Auschwitz and the way he envisions himself after Auschwitz. But she can only see herself as a prisoner. She has difficulty envisioning the future. Throughout the novel, what we see is she, he is the one that keeps convincing her. What? He convinces her. We are going to survive. We are going to get married one day. He tells her that she's beautiful. He says to her, you know, you're beautiful. She says, how could I be beautiful? I have no hair. He says, oh, I know, but you know what? Someday I'm gonna see your hair and it's gonna be beautiful in the future. And she says, you are wrong. There is no future. Gita feels the depth of despair. And what we realize about her, whereas Lali is marking numbers on all of the prisoners, for her, in her work at the administration building, she is actually seeing names. She is seeing birth dates. She is seeing the towns that people came from. And in many times, she, she knows where they're headed. And so what we see with her, the depth of her despair, what gets her through, what is sustaining her, is Lolly, his love, his optimism, his reassurances that they would survive. We do get to see a little more of Gita's strength, by the way, if you remember, at the end. When the Russians are coming, it's almost time for liberation. But in fact, they decide to evacuate the camp and they make the women, they take the women on a long march. And of course, Lali and Gita never even have a chance to say goodbye to each other. So now Gita is caught up in this whole throng of women and they're marching. And where we see her bravery is when she finally decides to run, make a run for it with this group of Polish girls. And they hide in the countryside and they go to a farmhouse and she hides among the poles. Ultimately, on her own, she is able to make it to Bratislava. And of course, ultimately, we know she is able to reunite with Lali. I want to talk a little bit about, about the ending, of course, later. But I do want to say to you, it's a love story. That's true. But it does take place in Auschwitz. And so there were certain scenes that were very poignant to me. And I'm wondering which, which scenes were poignant to you, were memorable to you. Any responses, any, any scenes? Someone mentioned that soccer game, which sounds so ridiculous, but actually there is confirmation about that, that the guards wanted to have a soccer game with the prisoners. And of course, Lolly organizes it and he says, hey guys, you know one thing, we have to lose this game. Of course, they didn't even have to throw the game. They started in the beginning, they were actually winning in the soccer game, but of course they were weak and uh, there were no, it was no contest between, the, between them and, and the well-fed, well-sports-dressed guards. What else? What scenes were, were poignant to you? There's a couple of chats, Deb. Oh, Debbie, you're on mute. 
Um, there was one from Paula that said that is because of her age, but I'm not sure what she was referring to. I think that was older. So, Paula, you want to? Um, because of her teenage, the, the way she acted, perhaps that was a response to that. Yes. Yeah, that was. Right. Absolutely true. And then Sherry wrote, I was happy when they met again after the war. And Paula wrote their lazy love making day as if they are free. And Rhonda Barton wrote, it was so important that he could trade the jewels for food. Exactly right. All of those things are so true. And again, it was all because he was a prisoner with privilege. Stephanie wrote also the themes were love, survival, cruelty, determination. And JC wrote the camps and them going from place to place looking for others. Right, exactly. Of course, what is very beautiful at the end, um, uh, we know, by the way, I thought it was fascinating that, uh, so she goes on the march and she ultimately makes it back to Bratislava. As far as Lolly, his ordeal isn't over with Auschwitz. Do you remember that? He's all of a sudden, uh, he's all of a sudden taken to Matthausen and he escapes from there. And then he goes to, um, he's taken to a sub camp and he's, uh, he escapes from there. And finally he's taken prisoner by the Russians. And finally, finally, he escapes from there. And uh, he gives bribes to people and he's able to finally get away after the Russians. And he's finally able to make it to Bratislava. And finally he's searching for her. And of course the story has, an unusually happy ending. Usually these stories don't end as happily. He is able to find her there. What's interesting, by the way, is that Gita and Lali do marry, as he had predicted, in 1945. But if you remember from the end of the book, their life is still not smooth sailing. They begin a, bu a business in Bratislava. By the way, I think this could be another book because they begin this business in Bratislava and the business is importing and exporting fabrics and textiles, and it's very successful. But in 1948, Lolly is arrested and he's imprisoned for supposedly exporting valuables from Czechoslovakia. So here he is, again, he's a prisoner, again, he's imprisoned, and again, they're trying to get him out. And again, they find themselves in the role of having to bribe officials. In the end, what's interesting is they are successful, they manage to escape, but picture that they have to escape in the dead of night, hiding behind a fake wall in a truck that takes them from Bratislava to Austria. And there, the author says, it's just like in a John le Carre novel, they have to pay off somebody at the Vienna train station and they secure tickets for Paris. From Paris, they get fraudulent passports for Sydney. And indeed, they finally land there in 1949. They settle in Melbourne. They once again get into the textile business. In 1961, when Gita was 36 years old, after years of trying, she's finally able to give birth to her son. And they name him Gary. And at that point with the birth of their son, there really is a happy ending. So my question to you is, why do you think Lolly had the need to write this book. His wife is gone. He wants to write this book. What's your thoughts? Any chats coming in? It was a Any love story. Up? It was a love story to his wife. A love story for his wife to his wife, absolutely true. I have a question. Wasn't she, didn't she say she wasn't Jewish? The author is not Jewish. Oh, but the author no. was not Jewish. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh no, I, of course, yeah, he, he was. Yeah. Uh, Marilyn also has her hand up. Marilyn, Marilyn's iPad. But you have to unmute yourself, Marilyn. No, she unmuted. Okay. Stephanie Swerdlow has her hand up too. Marilyn wants you unmute. Okay, now I'm unmuted. I had trouble. There she is. She's unmuted. Okay, um, Marilyn, go ahead. I think in addition to the fact that he wanted to do a love story to his wife, which I totally understand, I think that what he wanted to say to the world or whoever read it 
was despite all the bad things that happened in the world, don't give up. There's always hope and keep your courage going and it all will work out. So I think in addition to the love story, I think he wanted to give a story of uh, a lesson of, of courage and hope. I agree with you. You know, it's interesting because uh, Gary, his, their son at the end of the book, he's telling a little story about, he gives some insight about his parents. And he says, one of the things that happened was at one time when the business was having to close, he hears his mother, they're, uh, they're putting up a for sale sign, you know, in front of the house, they've sold their car and everything else. And he says to his mother, I hear you, I know you're packing everything up. Why are you, I hear you singing. How could you be singing? And her answer is, listen, when you've lived like I have and like your father has, and we didn't know if we would be dead in five minutes, there isn't much you can't deal with. And so there is that, that absolutely that, that message that no matter what, no matter how dark something is, there is always hope. Any other thoughts? Linda, there's a number of, that came in on the chat that I'll read to you. So from JC Mazamel, a type of purging of his thoughts and conscience. Rhonda Martin wrote, in the deepest despair, there can be hope. Dora wrote, as an inheritance to his son and on to the future. Terry Weinstein wrote, um, Holocaust survivors need to tell their story to the world. Dora wrote, the future. Ellen Rotterdam wrote, I think like most survivors, he wanted to tell his story before he passed. And um, we have Stephanie Swerdlow who also wanted to say something. So Stephanie wants to unmute. So it's, it's interesting because I think everything that everybody wrote on the chat is just relevant and, and true. I think it's so interesting that he chose somebody who was not Jewish. I mean, and he said because he didn't want um, to write it through their perceptions that he wanted this to be his story. But I also think that it was important to him almost as a testimony that that they did that this wasn't written by a Jew, a Jewish person who might be seen as as partial, but this was written as as a testimony. I think that's a very interesting thought, and um, I, I I think it's probably true. I think she might have gotten even a wider a wider audience. Who knows a wider audience because of that fact. And it does come up. By the way, in all of the interviews that I watched on YouTube, that comes up that comes up about her not being Jewish. Yeah. Linda, also, it came up twice on the chat. There was a question that maybe you know or don't know, but it was about the, um, the, Rom the Romani, is that how you say Romani. Romani. Um, That why they were kept as families by the Nazis. I don't know. I I just don't know. know. Yeah, I just know that it's interesting because I just got confirmation from Dr. Weisberg, Dr. Leanne Weisberg about that, who of course is our, our go-to man when he you know, anything about Holocaust. And I did get confirmation from him that, that they did keep them as families. I don't know why, yeah. Any other questions or thoughts on that? I wanna tell you that I think there was another reason why he wrote the book. I think, I think everyone is, everything is, everyone said I really do agree with. I think he bore witness to the horror that was Auschwitz and it's amazing even to him that he found love there. But I think there was another reason. Lolly wanted, I think in the, Author's notes at the end, Heather Morris says, in telling his story, Lolly was shedding the burden of guilt he had carried with him for more than 50 years, the fear that he and Gita might be seen as Nazi collaborators. So in one of the interviews that I saw with Heather Morris, she says that there are many lessons to be gleaned from the book, but she thinks that one of the most important lessons that Lolly wanted to point out was the importance of not judging people I think that Lolly wanted everyone to understand what was happening at that terrible time and to make no judgments. Because Lolly tells us in his own words, what Heather says were his words, he said, choosing to live is in itself an act of defiance. It is in its own way, a form of heroism. So people did what they had to do. And by the way, that, you know, that happens to be sort of a recurring theme in the story, if you remember. He talks about Silka, and he says to Silka, you know, you are one of the bravest people I ever met, and you did what you had to do to survive, and to me, you're a hero. He tells that to Silka. And of course, you also see he talks about, if you remember, at the very end of the book, 
he's taken as a Roman prisoner, uh, as, a, as a prisoner uh, to the Russians. Do you remember that? And he's given this really weird job, right? Do you remember? Not hard labor, but rather they give him the nice clothes. They give him a, tell him to take a hot bath. They give him nice clothes. They give him money. They give him jewels. And his job is to go into town and secure women, procure women for them, for their nightly parties. So he says, you mean you want me to be your pimp? He says, yes, yes, that's, that's what we want. And of course he does that. And ultimately that helps him escape because he's got some of those jewels. And he, when he makes a run for it, he's got some of the jewels that, that he had had. But there's no question that he, he worries when he's, he's doing this for these, these men. What are the girls going to, how are they going to respond? And it's fascinating. He goes to town, he goes to the boutique, he goes to the cafe. And what do you think the girls answer him when he offers, makes his offer? Hey, do you want to come to these parties with the men? You know what they say? Okay, what jewelry do you have? What can, what can we look at? How much, how much? Because the truth is people were doing what they had to, to survive. So he, he gives us numerous examples and he doesn't want anyone to be judgmental. Linda, um, on that subject, um, Robin had wrote, wasn't Silka considered a collaborator and why? Um, and continuing, Arlette um, Ehrlich wrote, survivors need to tell their stories to unburden them and share with the world. He, uh, Lolly crossed a cultural connection with the gypsies. We could all learn from his humanity, especially in today's world. And JC wrote that her father-in-law to his last day was torn between being glad he survived and guilty he escaped the camp. And I think that's understandable in survivor's guilt. Survivor's, survivor's guilt, yeah, yeah. So I think that's right. I think a lot of people, somebody mentioned that, that they just need to unburden themselves. I want to go back to Silka for a moment. Yes, she was. She was taken by the Russians. And that is the story, I guess, in Silka's journey. I've not read it yet. I don't know how many of you have read it. But um, yeah, she, she was considered a, a collaborator at one time. And uh, she obviously was not in the end, right? What I think is, by the way, lovely, I don't know how our timing is going, but I, I want to, I, I really enjoyed the afterword that Lolly and Gita's son Gary wrote at the back of the book. He tells about his life with his parents. He says his parents wanted him to enjoy life, all kinds of things, everything, hobbies, activities. They felt that they were robbed of their own youth and they didn't want him to miss out on anything. And in looking back, Gary said, his parents' house was always filled with love and affection. And he says, after 50 years of marriage, he'd often come home and he'd find them cuddling, holding hands and kissing. Gary closes the afterward by saying, he is forever grateful that he grew up in a home that was filled with warmth and love, smiles, affection and food. Mm -hmm. And I thought Gary's recollections were just the perfect way to end our discussion today, because not only did Lali and Gita survive Auschwitz, but so did the love that began there. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. Any other questions, by the way? Anybody have questions or comments or anything we left out you want to talk about? Marlene has Marlene? her hand up. Marlene Mazer has her hand up, so she wants to turn off her mic. Right. Yeah, I, mean, I remember in, in, in the afterward, Gary had said something, though, that his father, it was hard for his dad to show emotion. Yes. I guess he kept it all, he couldn't show it in the camp, and I guess he never learned to show it, you know, I don't know, to his son, only he could show it to his wife, I don't know, but that, that kind of raised a little flag in my head. Yes, yes. Um, there was a point when he said that, where he said that, but he said overall, he felt that it was a very loving home, but no question, father, there were, there were, um, listen, you know, going through an experience like that there, it's, it's, it's got to have residual effects. And I just wanted to mention that I had looked up some of the characters in real life and Beretsky was sent to prison and committed suicide after a few years. Right, right. Yes, he was convicted of war crimes and sentenced to life imprisonment, right. Any other comments or questions, thoughts about the book? Anything we left out that you want to talk about? Can you hear me? Yes. You, oh, you started off, I haven't read the book yet, but you started off saying that some of it is fiction and some of it, you know, when they did a fact check, it wasn't exactly right, which is understandable. But how do we know what is fact and what is fiction in his book? 
Right. Well, you know what, that's exactly, that is the question. That is always the question. So I was, in some of the articles, they explained what some of the things were. One of them was, do you remember the scene where there is a bus? They, uh, when he first comes to Auschwitz, he, one of the first horrors that he sees is he sees prisoners being marched into a bus. And then he sees gas being inserted into this bus. And then he sees bodies coming out. Well, according to one of the articles, they said there actually is no confirmation of that. So then that brings up the question that one of the New York Times reviewers did bring up. You know what, if you're going to fictionalize that kind of stuff, you don't need to fictionalize it. There were enough horrors. And if you do add fiction to it, does that not give a little credence to those that say, oh, you know, it wasn't that bad or Holocaust deniers or whatever it is, it undermines the credibility. So that is a question, you know, that's it's a very fair question. What is true and what isn't? Yeah. Diane Bourbon also has her hand up. Um, so Diane, if you want to unmute. Yeah, I just wanted to ask in the video that we saw at the beginning, he said, um, you know, I tattooed the number on Keith and she tattooed my heart. But I thought I remember the books that she was at the camp before he got there yes. so i'm wondering if that was just an ex you know like a cute thing you said or no he actually re-tattooed her she had been tattooed and then she was re-tattooed by him yeah why was she re-tattooed yeah i don't know they they don't say they don't say but it just says that she was re-tattooed yeah they did say that the quality of the tattooing was very poor so sometimes it didn't hold. So that's why she might have needed to have a re-tattoo. Perhaps. Or she had her eyes on him. That could have been another reason. <laughs> were, were there other tattooists in the camp? Well, okay. there were, it, it, at the time that he was there, it was another, there was Pepin who chose him to be his assistant. And then of course, Pepin disappears. And in the two and a half years that he was there, he took an assistant on with him by the name of Leon and he was his assistant. So there were the two of them at that time. By the way, you know, talking about fact and fiction, one of the other art things that came up, do you remember in the story, it said there were these horrible interchanges that were just gave you shivers every time Mengele walked by him. Remember that? Mengele would sort of taunt him. Oh, one of these days I'm going to come back for you. Well, one of the reasons he said that, if you remember in the story, is that he came by one day and he took Leung, who was the assistant, and he did experiments on him. And he, in the end, he ended up castrating him. So one of the things that one of the articles said was actually it's unknown if Mengele, it's, it's, it's unusual to think that he did any kind of experiments on men. Generally speaking, it was on the women and on the girls. So that's one of the things we don't know. Is that absolutely true? According to Lolly, you know, she says that that's what Lolly told her. Um, Linda, Terry Levy has her hand up and we're gonna probably end with her question. Um. You have to unmute, Terry. Wait, we still can't hear Terry. Hold on one second. Let's see if we can help her can out. Can you hear me? Terry, why don't you chat your questions? Oh. Wait, that's not going to work. This is the generational thing that we're all struggling <laughs> trying to get this right. But I'm really impressed. We're doing it. We're doing it, guys. That's the important yeah, and what I wanted to say was I wanted to thank everybody for your um, participation and your patience as we journey through this new part of <laughs> cultural arts and figuring out how to stay connected virtually. So, you know, of course, major thank you to Linda for leading us today. Um, and there are many people in the chat who wrote, thank you, thank you, thank you, Linda, for another wonderful review. Thank you all for your participation. Excellent. Yeah. And I want to invite everybody to join this partnership of the Friends of the Sterling Road Library and David Posnick, JCC, for another book review, which will be on July 21st. And it is going to be The Dutch House by Anne Patchett, which I actually personally just finished this weekend um, and recommend. But I recommend any book that Linda is going to review. So I'm, <laughs> I'm not very partial I mean, to anything there. But Linda, what was the book that you want to do for August in case people already read 
the Ann Patchett book and are ready for July, what should they read for August? You know what? I think we better, um, I think we better send that out to everybody because, yeah. Okay. August. Okay, so August is undecided, so we will get you that August book um, through email, but I highly recommend reading the Ann Patchett book, The Dutch House, for the July 21st uh, book review, and we will be doing, we'll be sending out emails again about that. So thank you, everybody, for coming today. Thank you, our friends at the Sterling Road Library for joining with us. Um, thank you for our DPJCC members and participants and everybody in our community that made today so wonderful. Most of all, thank you. Liz. And I'm so glad to see everybody. It's great to see your faces. It's been a long time, so it's great to see everybody. I don't know how to put my face on there. No, re no refreshments? I know, I know. You have coffee in your kitchens, guys. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. You were very good. Very, very. Thank you. Great to be with how you. How do I get my face on Zoom? <laughs> start your video. Thanks, Thank Linda. You very much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you.